record um, the seminar for our YouTube our YouTube channel and knock on wood, hopefully my internet is gonna hold up even though um, two other people are using it. <laughs> okay, so um, introducing you to Kate Fulliger and I profusely apologize. I have a tendency to misspell certain words. My books are full of colonial ears instead of eras and your last name is one of them. I keep wanting to put it Ian. <laughs> So um, entirely my fault. I've got it right in about half of the instance. This is wrong in the other half. So Kate Fulliger, with an AR at the end, is Professor of History at the Australian Catholic University and also at the moment co-editor of uh, History of Australia, the journal. Um, she is a specialized, specialist in the history of 18th century world, particularly the British Empire and the various um, indigenous societies they encountered. Um, she is now at the ACU and I've been um, saying to all and sundry, ACU have been recruiting all the best people recently. Hence, we have two of them on our lineup again for next semester. Um, so we're very pleased um, to have you, Kate. She um, graduated from the ANU with an honors degree in history, then did her MA and PhD um, at Berkeley. Um, went around the place a bit, Sydney, Macquarie, um, various visiting fellowships, York, place close to Emma and my heart, my heart uh, Duke, Yale, Princeton, so been all around the world um, and is now at ACU and officially at Melbourne campus, right? Yes. Yes, officially the Melbourne campus. She's the author of a number of books and also co-authored several books and the latest one is the award-winning The Warrior, The Voyager and The Artist, Three Lives in an Age of Empire. Um, and we did have the link to your profile on the program that was circulated. So I assume I'm preaching to the choir and everyone is well informed anyway. So today we're very excited, looking forward to hearing about remembering Cook again, the state of the field. And without that, I'll hand over to Kate. Um, roughly 45 minutes. As I said, I'm not going to be too German about it. And then we'll have another roughly 45 minutes for question and answers. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks so much, everybody. I'm sharing my screen now. Is that working for you guys? Yes. I've got presenter view, Kate. Oh, yeah, presenter view. Hang on. Mm -hmm. It should be right, shouldn't it? Mm. Uh, slideshow. Yeah, we've still you've got to change the um have you got two screens? Oh, that could be it. Hang you've on. got to change the screen that is the main sc screen you want to share from. Sorry. Did you see swap displays, Kate, at the top of the options when you had the slideshow on before? There's a little swap displays um arrow set. Sorry, it's Emma talking to you. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, do you see the swap um, displays next to the tips? There's a swap display. Yes. Uh, awesome. Yeah, try that. See if it works. Oh, yeah. perfect. You guys are much better. I worked out with myself the other day. And fabulous. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. Well, here is, uh, this is actually not even that necessary, but I thought I'd put it up there instead of just having me uh, face you. Thanks so much for having me, everybody. Um, as I said to Claudia, when she originally um, invited me, I was absolutely delighted to be invited so I could go to an actual campus and meet real historians in person, but not to be. But thank you for tuning in and listening to me anyway. Um, I am speaking to you from Nambri and Ngunnawal speaking land, um, and I appreciate all the different lands that you um, either put in your uh, name or in the chat. Um, I'd like to pay my respects particularly to any Indigenous people who are zooming in, um, and I might also warn them that there are some distressing images for Indigenous people in this presentation. Um, I should also warn that this, this work actually also was just published by the wonderful Australian um, Historical Studies. Um, I had, I should you know, defend myself, but I had ex um, accepted this invitation to speak on this topic when I really thought that it was going to come out in November. So I was going to give you the little sneak preview, but now it's out. So I'm sorry that if you have read this, this may be a bit boring. Um, but if you haven't, then this will be an easier way of um, absorbing it. Uh, so yes. The, the, the paper's really based on an article that I was um, kind of commissioned to do for AHS. Um, it's the third such uh, type of article that AHS have presented on the state of the field, um, inaugurated, I believe, by the book reviews editors. Uh, about once a year, the journal produces a state of the field article. 
But the first two articles were about the state of the history of emotions um, by Sarah Pinto and the state of migrant history by Ruth Balant and Zora Simich. So my brief was to talk about the state of history on Captain Cook, which of course would be pretty much laughable um, compared to those other fields in any other place of the world except for here. But in this corner of the globe, historians recognize that the cook industry is gigantic and must be accounted for. Um, uh, it infiltrates our public life in every way. Most prime ministers voice an opinion on him. Newspapers attack whole segments of society through him. We even pay policemen to guard cook statues at night. We've also just come through, so just going to click uh, this different bit here. Um, we've also just come through three pretty solid years of Cook commemoration, starting in 2018, which was 250 years since the Endeavour left Britain. So, uh, so how did I go about limiting uh, the scope for this review um, survey? Well, I knew I had to go right up to the present minute, of course, particularly because these last three, three years have been so intense. And I knew I had to include the full range of work on Cook, not just focus on scholarship. In this field, the non-scholarly output, output has such a strong effect that it arguably shapes the direction or the possibilities of historical research, so it can't be ignored. And I decided to start in the late 1990s. Now, my somewhat arbitrary, this is going to work. I... There we go. Um, my somewhat arbitrary start maker was an influential um, review essay um, by Greg Denning on the then most recent cookbooks. Um, and that, that sort of state of the review um, of his own essay was published in the Mill William and Mary Quarterly in 1997. They never stop appearing, these cookbooks, is how Denning began that review essay. Well, indeed. I should add that Denning included in his essay the results of a search that he conducted in 97, which showed 4,588 titles on James Cook in the Mitchell Library catalogue. It's not quite a search that is replicable today, but I tried to replicate it as much as I could, and I came up with 6,689 titles published since Denning's essay. So Denning's review is a good marker for me because it finished off, as it were, an earlier era of Cook work that had been very much centered on scholarship. Denning focused in his essay on the fiery debate just then uh, subsiding between two American anthropologists, Marshall Salins and Gananath Abisakera, which had really been about Cook's death or how Cook's death was figured in the Pacific imagination of the 18th century. Today, the energy of Cook work is more often seen in galleries, museums, podcasts, and trade books, and it tends to avoid the moment of death, favoring instead Cook's life or his afterlife. And it looks at how those how um, these these topics, Cook's life and his afterlife, uh, manifested in British and in settler imaginations as much as it did in the Pacific world. So in the end, I divided up my article into what I think have been a Cook's three main contexts during the last quarter century. And these are Cook in British history, Cook in the settler colony, and Cook in the Pacific. Now, my general thesis is that Cook studies is unusually dominated by Australian and New Zealand concerns, even when they're produced by other peoples and about Cook in other places. And further, since those Australasian concerns have escalated in tension over the last 25 years, Cook studies in turn has become an increasingly fraught field. Very roughly, you can detect the fraught characteristic as an overriding tone of defensiveness when you look at Cook in British history. You can see it as one of anxiety when looking at Cook in settler history and, and as a kind of reaction against Australasian dominance when looking at Cook in the Pacific. So that's kind of my general um, kind of um, take on, um, on the survey. Uh, and so now I'm gonna try and unpack it in those three contexts, British history, settler history, and Pacific history. So uh, first off, Cook in British history. The majority of general Cook biographies 
falls under this heading of Cook in British history. That is, they usually trace Cook's full life as an agent in and of the British nation. They don't necessarily favour the endeavour, um, which Australians do to a quite ridiculous degree. They look at all three of Cook's southern voyages, which went from 1768 to his assassination in Hawaii in 1779. Right, so that's uh, the, the 11 years. Um, these books often have a very naval focus and they all, without exception, pretty much without exception, rate Cook as, I quote, one of the greatest navigators of all time. Now, more intriguingly, what I detected amongst these titles, of which um, these on the screen are just the most popular, is a defensiveness about a presumed Antipodean critique. Uh, Frank Lynn, I'll just put him up there, who's published one of the most reviewed books, uh, published by Yale University Press, explained that he was defending Cook against a creeping new tendency to view Cook through the lens of colonial exploitation, he said. This tendency was most detectable, he thought, in Australian academics and in, I quote, developing country propagandists. I think there probably should be a hyphen between developing and country, but I wasn't quite so sure, so I just gave you the verbatim quote. Now, such types, right, Australian academics and um, propagandists, have insisted wrongly, for McGlynn, um, on remembering Cook through, I quote, a filter of race, empire, violence, and disease. I should give you a little heads up. That's not what I turned out to find, sadly. Uh, they do not generally filter it through a filter of um, race, empire, violence, and disease. Um, I should also note here that one of my peer reviewers for the article um, wanted me to excise McGlynn uh, completely um, on the grounds of McGlynn being, quote, woeful. I kind of agree that he is woeful. It's a very fat book that I had to read for this uh, for this article. But unfortunately, that's not how this survey goes. You know, McGlynn's volume got the second most reviews on Goodreads than any other cookbook that I examined. A slightly less aggressive but equally, equally popular book was Tony Horvitz's, uh, there he is, um, Into the Blue, which is kind of like a semi-history, semi-reenactment of Cook's voyages. Like McGlynn and all the others, American Horvitz thought, quote, and I quote, uh, thought that Cook was, and I quote, the greatest navigator in history. He undertook his book as a way of connecting with his Australian wife's birthplace, a country he thought had, I quote, a bewilderingly tense relationship with Cook. Horvitz is more sympathetic than McGlynn to those that he calls outside men, which were the Indigenous peoples most affected by Cook's expeditions. But his book is yet primarily an attempt to discover Cook against a settler context of obsession and forgetting. Over and over, the two, um, same two themes emerge. Cook was the sublimest navigator, the master of voyaging, the original adventurer, or for Vanessa Colling Collingridge, as you can see there, one of the books up there, um, quite simply, the greatest explore, explorer in the history of our planet. Second, the second main theme is that he has been unfairly maligned by, I quote, the colonial relations between settlers and natives, or another quote, the tyrannical views of Australians. Now, as you might imagine, the consistency of these themes has entailed two overriding consequences. The first consequence is that for Cook to be the greatest of all time, the voyaging skills of everybody that he sailed amongst, namely the indigenous people, have to be less impressive despite the fact that their entire heritage, if we're talking about Pacifica people, is bound up with voyaging and that they were already in every place that Cook went to. The second uh, consequence is that defensiveness becomes the chief hallmark of recent Cook work that understands the captain as a British actor. Now, for sure, many scholars over the last 20 years have tried to counter that story and that tone, and I count myself amongst them but I have to conclude that they have not had the impact that they wish for, given what we saw in the anniversary years most recently. This is partly for the usual reasons of academic kind of marginalization compared to more popular or best-selling books. Um, but it's also because ironically, the scholarly efforts to focus more on the political and cultural structures that explain Cook have somehow divorced their work off from Cook studies. The more common revision to the, quote, sorely defended heroic Cook is either a funny fiddle with imperial chronology or a retreat into science. 
And what I mean by that is that some scholars, and I'd name um, John Robson here and Glyn Williams, both of their books are up there on that little montage. Um, those scholars admit that the colonial critique of Cook does make him look a bit problematic, but really Cook came before empire proper. So it's not as powerful as a critique as you once thought. That's their general kind of gist. As an historian myself of 18th century slavery, dispossession and trade though, I do find the idea that empire hadn't begun by the 1770s to be eyebrow raising to say the least. Other scholars, as I've said, um, have thought instead to divert attention to the astronomical, cartographic, botanic, zoological, navigational and ethnographic advances made by Cook's expeditions, right? So if it's not a fiddle of the imperial chronology, then it's kind of a, a, a refocus on the science of Cook's voyages. And that science is truly overwhelming um, in the context of European science at the time. The effect of this kind of redirection on science though, whether it's deliberate or not, has been to sanitize Cook by focusing on the volume of the gains rather than on their decidedly Western metrics, methods and effects. Now, many British public events about Cook in the last few years testify uh, to the victory of the heroic Cook um, subject, or at least to the hedged about Cook, right? So if not the, the heroic greatest navigator of all time, then, he, then he's at least the Cook that is maybe not quite as imperial as he once thought, or um, just basically a herald of science, right? These include uh, exhibitions in Lincoln in 2014, at the Natural History Museum in 2018, uh, all of those focused on the precious objects brought back by Cook, reducing each of those relics to relics of science rather than relics of, um, of, of empire. Um, uh, that included smaller events in Cook's native Yorkshire aimed to, quote, celebrate Cook's groundbreaking achievements in cartography and sheer competence in captaining ships, right? That's from the Yorkshire crowd. Uh, and the Royal Mint um, in the 2018 celebratory year produced commemorative Cook uh, coins, quote, in tribute of Captain Cook's legacy of scientific discovery. The Royal Mail followed suit issuing 10 stamps to mark how Cook, quote, set new standards for cartography, scientific inquiry and exploration. And there were also, as some of you might know, three mega exhibitions in London that don't fit that, that, that kind of um, heroic bill. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those three exhibitions at the end of the talk. But it's important to note here that the more local events and the more everyday things like coins and stamps reflected a sense of Cook in British life that continued to obscure the people that he sailed among. This was a cook reanimated in the last 25 years by perversely a perceived attack on him by Anglophone settlers in the global south. And so it's to those settlers, um, Anglophone settlers in the global south that I'm now going to uh, turn. Right, so that's uh, Cook in the settler colony. Now, as I said, as much as I've loved to, as much as I would have loved to discover a bunch of tyrannical Antipodeans filtering Cook history through a lens of race, empire, violence, and disease, uh, it's not as it turned out what I found. If I were to summarize the recent work on Cook in Australian and New Zealand history, I'd say that instead of defensiveness, um, or instead of being defensive, it tended to diverge quite dramatically between the searingly provocative and dare I say, the curiously bland. This effect is the result, not of some imagined critique going on elsewhere, but of an escalating struggle at home over Cook's role in unstable settler origin stories. Now, evidence for this struggle can be seen in a variety of formats. Here's just a quick reminder of things that we've just lived through. Uh, for example, it appears in the confounding remarks by some political leaders in the conflict over statues, in the polemicization found in short medium um, uh, short, short form media accounts, right? So just to uh, remind us of our recent history, 2018 saw for the first time, Australia's deputy nationals leader um, elevate uh, to the parliamentary executive, the common schoolyard mix up between Philip's arrival and Cook's landing. She thought First Nations feelings deserve to be recognized, but quote, the reality is 26 January, 1788 is when the course of our nation changed forever and Captain Cook stepped ashore. Uh, New Zealand might perhaps best eliminate the Cook statue conflicts. I know that we thought we had Cook statue problems, but New Zealand had it in, a much, in, in sort of a more dramatic way. Um, there were defacements by Maori people and by Maori's, um, Maori allies. 
um, that occurred so frequently and with such forceful eloquence about invader theft. You can see the graffiti there. Um, uh, there was eloquence also about prior possession and about indigenous connections to worldwide black movements that some resulted in, um, or that they resulted in one of them being removed and some others being boarded up. You can see my middle picture there is a picture that sort of plywood box is a Cook statue boarded up. Finally, both nations have endured the doubling down of Cook apologists in the populist press. Those questioning the number and origin of Maori killings, for instance, or those likening critics to the Taliban. And rebuttals, perforce, of course, have gradually become ever more basic, right? So to counter these brutish views, you have to use up all the oxygen available by saying the kind of the obvious rather than trying to advance the nuance, right? And that's what I mean by the kind of the, 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 the problem of the polemicization of this topic. The struggle, in other words, is very public, can reward participants on either side, depending on the political party or the media mogul in power, but it mostly results in ongoing simplification of the terms of debate. Now, longer form analyses of Cook's life in the Antipodes from the, from the settler regions um, have responded to this atmosphere in mostly, I'd have to say, pretty bland ways. True, they tend to resist the kind of grand claims to singular greatness that repeats so much in those general biographies. Um, like for instance, even those books by well-known contrarians like Peter Fitzsimons, Geoffrey Blaney and John Maloney stop short of praising Cook as if the endeavor sailed amongst people without history. But between a consciousness of what can no longer stand, and, and I think that Fitzsimons, Blaney and Maloney all know what can no longer stand, um, but between that and the inevitably kind of ongoing draw of Cook, these kind of productions often arrive at remarkably attenuated theses, remarkably kind of bland theses. Fitzsimons deploys his usual overreading of the sources in order to find out his, his ambition was to find out who the real Captain Cook, uh, James Cook was. But in the end, he offered little advancement on good bloke, taciturn, knowledgeable, determined. Blaney trumpets that his book will, quote, challenge accepted views. But ultimately, I think it suggests only that Aboriginal people were as ingenious in their discoveries of East, Eastern Australia as was Cook. Maloney goes a bit further than Blaney in admiring Australia's original inhabitants, though again, he does so mostly to match them to the excellence of Cook. While all these three titles, um, uh, uh, while, while all these three books kind of title their books um, on some variation of Cook, so it's James Cook, Cook's Voyage, or just Cook Claiming the Land, um, really their only concern is the endeavor. Each is really or only a work of nationalist history, understanding the endeavor as some kind of foundational conveyance system. They focus disproportionately on Australia with their next best interest being New Zealand. This program, uh, sorry, so um, speaking of New Zealand, I might add that the New Zealand government's official celebration of the 250th anniversary also falls into, dare I say, the curiously bland. Um, this program actually looked pretty refreshing to my Australian eyes. Um, it was given a Maori name, uh, Tuia uh, 250, um, and it included as its centerpiece three European replica vessels and three Pacifica vessels touring um, at multiple New Zealand venues throughout 2019. But upon closer inspection, the program drew quite marked criticism from Maori people, not so much for being um, kind of a blatantly racist apology for Cook, but for dulling all the politics of the commemoration in its insistence on mutuality. The terms shared and dual heritage were bandied about so much that even I got sick of it. Critics protested the flattening of Cook's arrival into an encounter that started something mutual. They reminded the government that it was rather really an invasion that started the disadvantage of only one of those parties for centuries. There've been some other Cook exhibitions um, recently, and I think um, that, that I think were also a bit bland, but I'll leap over those now to discuss the flip side of that kind of muted response, which is the kind of the spiky or the provocative response. And a beautiful way into uh, those examples is Alastair Punga Somerville's article from 2019 called 250 Ways to Start an Essay About Captain Cook. Um, that article, I believe in 2020, 
was then turned into this short book with this um, cover that you'll see here. Now, to paraphrase the article's 210th um, way, uh, Toponga Somerville writes, if you don't come out of a history about Cook both angry and sad, then it has told you a lie. In the settler colony, there's no room for, for blandness, is what she's intimating. To understand how Cook exists at the epicenter of identity discourses for Australians and New Zealanders is to know that festivals of mutuality are just not going to cut it. Toponga Somerville's article is in fact a perfect summation of what such a realization produces at this moment. It is in essence 250 paragraphs of stalled ideas, burdened thoughts, impasses. Because of the state of origin stories in the settler colony, we can't move forward very well on Cook research. We can't seem to get beyond either extreme kind of dumbed down, you know, silliness, um, beyond bland worry, or beyond deeply frustrated repetitions of how Indigenous sovereignty still has no air in settler colonial life. We repeat and repeat important critiques, but ones that feel so old to so many by now. And among the most compelling examples of this latter sentiment, the kind of the repetition of what should be kind of now taken for granted, but is not, I would say are artworks made by Aboriginal, Torres Strait and Maori people in the last 20 years. Now I go into this, um, this kind of part of um, the response in more detail in the article, but I might just briefly mention here the installations of Lisa Rahani, Rachel Rakini, uh, Rakina and Johnson Witahira, the poetry of Robert Sullivan, the prints of Christian Thompson, Steve Gibbs, Michael Cook, the sculptures of Jason Wing, um, the paintings of Gordon Siren, Daniel Boyd, Vincent Namajira, Marlene Gil Gilson, they go on. Together, these artistic outputs describe the chief modes by which Indigenous people have used Cook to repeat their comment on settler colonial conditions, right? And that is the way that they override what might have been. Here we can see a Gilson um, picture. Uh, the way that they erase First Nations presence. It's a beautiful picture of erasure, I think. Uh, the way that they could yet change in the future. This is Namajira's rather hopeful painting but also the way that for some, they constitute outright banditry. It's not all stark um, polemical refutation though, or boring kind of both sidesisms. I point out here that, uh, that, that I think that there are at least two important exceptions, two works that both resist the blandness and help to add nuance to understandings of Cook in the settler colony. And these were the two ones that I picked out anyway were Aileen Morton Robinson's The White Possessive and Maria Nugent's Captain Cook was here. Um, I possibly were going to be now preaching to people who actually know these books quite well, but I will just quite quickly uh, wrap up or my, my impression of, of their contributions was that Morton Robinson's book uh, was a work of critical Indigenous studies that deconstructed Cook's words and acts of possession uh, so as to trace exactly how they triggered ongoing denials of Indigenous sovereignty. Um, in Australasia. It brought discursive analysis to the field um, and reminded readers that Indigenous authors are, all, are mostly only interested in Cook, of course, because of what he can help us say about the present. Ever since Captain Cook's original choice, uh, Morton Robertson writes, ever since his original choice not to gain our consent, the legacy of white possession continues to function socio-discursively within Australian society. This is her, um, her summation. Nugent's vol volume, um, a sort of a counterpart, gives us more of an ethno history of Indigenous behaviour during Cook's eight days in Botany Bay. It's a turning away from Cook himself, even while Cook maintains kind of the absent centre. It gives us what used to be called a thick description of Indigenous life, not just that they were there, but how they were there hour by hour um, through those eight days. It also includes a, a summative reflection at the end of how those eight days have been depicted in culture ever since. So again, both of them are really talking about Cook's life and in, in, in both senses, Cook's afterlife. Uh, there is one other area of dynamism in Cook settler study or settler Cook studies, um, which I've privately called Cookism, which is the history of Cook history 
um, in the Antipodes, which is you know, mostly the 19th and the 20th century memorialization of Cook. It's a very rich um, subfield. It's peopled by scholars like Katrina Schlunke, uh, Stephen Mewkey, Stephen Gaps, James Bellich. Um, it is apparently um, the subject of Tony Ballantyne's new project. But since one of their grand points collectively is that Cookism has very little to do with Cook history, I will sadly sacrifice my discussion of them here. I will in fact close my discussion on Cook in the settler colony entirely here, leaving out perhaps unfairly any judgment on the National um, Museum of Australia's Endeavour show that was the last one to close um, uh, earlier this year. I will say that I appreciated that very much. It's just down the road from where I'm living right now. I will say that I did appreciate that show very much. Um, I appreciated the careful attention to recent trends in Cook scholarship, especially the deconstructive and the ethno-historical approaches, both of which you could see kind of emerge from Morton Robinson and from Nugent. I could, I have to say, though, have done without the humongous quotes by Peter Fitzsimons in 98 point font written all over the walls, but we can't have everything. So um, the area, the sort of the third and the last area that I want to turn to is how Cook studies has flourished the most, I argue, in, uh, in Pacific history. And I just want to see what my next star uh, here we go. Um, so so th th this subfield of Cook in the Pacific, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Let me go back here. Let me go. Just, this is where I'm going to head on to next. Um, uh, th this subfield, of course, has been less troubled by endeavour anniversaries because there's no sense here in which any one of the three Cook voyages is more important than the other, because all three are equally important. Um, uh, they're less restrained by either post-imperial defensiveness, therefore, or by settler colonial agonies. And so work in this vein has been able to develop the possibilities that open up when commentators are receptive uh, to long ignored local perspectives. The invitations to see the Cook voyages from, uh, from the other side of the ship's railing or from the other side of empire have resulted in many works going beyond the mere inclusion of indigenous voices or, the, um, or even the cessation of, of ground to them. They've instead provoked productions that try to reveal how Cook's voyages were constituted by the people's places and objects to which he sailed. They show that the encountered was not just the neglected part of Cook's history, now freshly recovered, but the very engine that forged Cook's world, his achievements and his role in history. This kind of work reveals something of the weight of Australasian turbulence in most of the rest of Cook studies by showcasing what can emerge when you're free from it. So these are the three books that I kind of chose as most exemplifying that potential, um, uh, that flourishing. They're Anne Salmon's uh, Trial of the Cannibal Dog, um, Nick Thomas's Discoveries, and David Chang's The World and All the Things Upon It. Now, in many ways, those, those first, uh, many ways, those first two, Salmon and um, Tom, Thompson, uh, Thomas, um, could stand as kind of Pacific counterparts to Nugent's ethno history of, of Botany Bay. They are each written from a perspective steeped in ethno history, where, it, where it's impossible to describe any victory over scurvy or any triumph of diplomacy or any narrow escape from a reef as occurring without Islander presence. There's no sense in these works, as Thomas writes, of Cook as the lone director of a remarkable mission. He was not author of the script. He was in the midst of a crowd. And Anne Salmon adds, this crowd was emphatically oceanic. Mana and honor, revenge and utu, taboo and the sacred, all had points of coincidence, out of which working relationships between Europeans and Pacifica people could be constructed. That's Salmon's summary. Now, if Salmon and Thomas might match Nugent, I think that the Hawaiian David Chang's book somewhat recalls Morton Robinson's deconstructive analysis of Cook and his legacies. But Chang focused only on Hawaii, um, and he describes the usual account of Cook's in, um, encounters there and the way that it, it shaped, that, that they've been shaped perceptions of Hawaiian acquiescence to foreign power um, ever since and right up to US annexation in 1898 and so on. Um, in kind of contravention to that narrative that he gives us, Chang describes the Cook moment rather as Hawaiians exploring, containing 
and eventually defeating Cook. Right, this is where it's in Hawaii, of course, that Cook meets his demise. And this in turn allows him to point out the consistency with which most past writers have neglected Hawaiian agency in their narratives of all post-Cook events. A sense of both oceanic um, encompassing and the agency of the encounter similarly pervade many contemporary artistic approaches that kind of match that um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and Maori um, output that I showed before. Um, there are a lot of Pacific artists doing the same. I think the most famous and eloquent artist on this score is Michael Tufri. He's based in Aotearoa, but he's of Samoan, Raitan, um, uh, Tahitian and um, Tongan descent, a background that has pushed his interest in Cook's voyages um, in a particularly diverse manner, I think. He's produced a series of paintings and prints about Cookie, as he calls him, since the late 90s, um, and they, which comprehensively provincialize the European newcomer. In them, Cook is represented in the distinctive style of Pacifica patterning, usually with birds, flowers, or fish in his ears who stand in for historical Pacifica informants. At other times, Cook's shown with Pacifica tamoka on his face or haitiki um, ornaments on his collar, you can see there. Cook in these images is a man overtaken by and indebted to the region that he sought to claim. That's the best way to survey though, how this Pacific centered work has impacted the exhibition space. The best way to wrap up, in other words, is to look at the three big blockbuster shows that um, opened in London on Cook in 2018. The first biggest and splashy, splashiest was the British Library's Voyages show. Actually, it wasn't technically the biggest, someone just corrected me, but it was definitely the splashiest, um, which happened at uh, the British Library. Now, rightly aware that it holds some of the rarest documents about the three Cook expeditions in the world, the library was virtually compelled to stage a blockbuster in that, in that year. However, through although it included keynotes and um, uh, from some of the game changers just discussed here, um, and although it did, uh, that it also constructed by far the most extensive and enduring website for those who couldn't go, the exhibition was maybe the least representative of the new Pacifica-based scholarship. In, it included a lot of detail about Indigenous peoples, but it never quite made the connection between those aspects and Cook's ability to function in Oceania. A quote from the critic Rosalind Carr, who went there, a fellow historian who went there, and she said, it resulted in an uncomfortable neutrality. Without a courageous interrogation of the myths of Cook, the broader contextualization, the explanation of how the guns existed alongside those botanical drawings, it does not go far enough. One could leave this ex exhibition without a proper understanding of why some Pacific Islanders annually celebrate Cook's death. A much smaller, but in some ways, a kind of a reply to the British Library was the British Museum's reimagining Cook. This show was bolder in borrowing works that it didn't happen to hold. It was bolder in thinking more laterally about Cook's period. And it was bolder in foregrounding Pacific views over British accounts. It did draw though some criticism for being so very small and for setting up Pacific objects in such a way that it could maybe imply naivety to um, European relics. You can see the kind of the, the references to these commentaries in my article. But overall, it was applauded for showing how Cook's interactions were complex, multi-directional exchanges in which indigenous knowledge and action were key. That's um, a quote from, from the show. It resisted neutrality, though it may have introduced in the process some kind of obscuring, I guess, a little bit by introducing the idea that it could have been a small and naive um, collection um, that resulted. For my money, I think the most successful show was the one shown at the Royal Academy. It was called Oceania. It was patently a nod to Cook's anniversary year. There's no accident that it occurred in 2018, um, but it, uh, it eschewed actually any direct referencing to that kind of obviousness in its titling. Right? Cook doesn't appear in the title, it's just about Oceania. That most London subway users would have yet understood it to be a Cook show though, uh, when they saw it in, um, you know, on their travels through the summer of 2018, is perhaps some tribute to the oceanization of Cook studies. Cook appeared in the exhibition, as did some analysis of the problems of Cook's collection of curiosities and his representation in the Pacific today. But the vast majority of the show was devoted to centering 
oceanic skills, oceanic arts and oceanic histories. It opened with a giant blue wave weaving that led to an in-depth discussion of oceanic navigation and ended with the ways that islanders have on the whole absorbed, defied or otherwise survived European empire. It was generously spaced in sumptuous rooms. It celebrated the world that Cook moved through. And it was emphatically not neutral about awarding Cook a new position in Cook history. I think Oceania points to the most promising horizon for future thinking about Britain's famous uh, Pacific expeditions. After three especially intense years of Cook Remembrance, Cook Studies may ease up a little now um, in terms of its pace and its enthusiasm. But I have to say the steadiness of outputs over the last 20 years um, casts some doubt on that prediction. Cook attracts commentators, especially in um, uh, 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 scholars who are interested in the imperial problems of British history, um, in the reckoning of settler colonial nationalism with the past, and in the realization of the Pacific's neglected complexity. And none of those three issues look like they're going to disappear in the foreseeable future. So I think it, it augurs more Cook studies. My compressed survey of the field identifies three main modes in recent Cook studies. Evidently, all those three modes are open to contestation. Um, and of course, they kind of bleed into each other um, on occasion. It would appear, though, that the initial two modes, the ones about Cook in, the, in British history and Cook in the settler colonies, um, are the most turbulent or unresolved. Both seem to be reacting to persistent tensions in Australian and New Zealand societies, imagined or real, but none that can begin to heal while the question of original sovereignty continues. The Pacific Islands still wrangle, of course, with the brutal legacies of colonialism today, but there I think greater degrees of indigenous autonomy may account for the ways that this region has inspired some freer or newer understandings of its Cook past. Some productive ways forward for Cook studies may involve awarding greater attention to the nature of empire in which um, Cook operated. Another way forward as exemplified, I think by Nugent and Morton Robinson, is for histories of Cook to be more open to other methodologies um, than history, than historical, um, more focused on what can be refigured uh, and more explicit about the times in which they're made. And finally, Cook studies should increasingly recognize that its very existence as a field owes chiefly to Cook's three voyages to Oceania, which in turn owed so much to the lands and the societies that they moved among. As Michael Tufri recent com recently commented, um, it's time to turn to the rest of the mob who were actually there. Sorry, it went on a little tiny bit long, but I will um, conclude just here. Sorry, forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much. I didn't actually notice that you went on too long because I was so wrapped up. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm just going to stop.